Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Ian is a full-time maker of sought-after prestige knives, beautifully made high-performance folders created out of some of very exotic and desirable materials. Now, he does all this with his own two hands and his PhD-level redneck engineering skills. His words, not mine. Uh, If you remember, Ian was on episode 40. We had a great conversation and decided back then that there was much more to talk about, so now he's back. And I really look forward to catching up with him. Uh, But first, are you crazy about knives? Do you like this show? Well, then check us out on Patreon. We have three levels of support. And for your trouble, you get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview and midweek supplemental podcast with no ads during the show. And at the top tier of support, you're automatically entered into a monthly knife giveaway. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, hosting, servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review, donation, and giveaway. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Ian, welcome back to the Knife Junkie. How you doing? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, I have been, uh, ever since we finished up our podcast over a year ago, I've been kind of watching and and uh, keeping my eye on your work. And man, it's, it's getting more and more and more refined uh, the more I see it. And, I, and I'm seeing similar, well, I, I see that there's one model that is hitting that people just want uh, like mad. But before we get there, let's let's remind some of the listeners how you got here. Uh, how did you become a knife maker and uh, how did you get to such a state of refinement at such a young age? I uh, So I don't have a background with any machines, anything like that. I, uh, I worked at, I, I graduated high school in 2013. Um, I've been working since I was 12 doing landscaping, kind of running my own business. And uh, Right out of high school, uh, I started going to college and just wasn't for me. So I started working at Starbucks um, and I I somehow just got into knives and I kept collecting knives. You know, I started where everyone does at the, you know, $10 uh, junkyard karambit that you get. The one that's like spray painted blue and has spider webs on it. And I kind of went from there to, you know, uh, the little older slip joints, uh, Schrade, and then I got into... uh, like Kershaw. And I thought Kershaw at that point, I was like, wow, $30 for a night. That's crazy. <laughs> then I got into Balasongs. And uh, that's when I realized that knives could really be pretty expensive. And I got tired of collecting them. I just, on a Starbucks budget, I wasn't able to buy any knives. So I decided to start making them or at least working on them. So I started modifying Balasongs in uh, 2016, uh, just, just for fun. And then it started to become a business. And then I met up with a local knife maker before I moved to Arizona, uh, Tough Knives, who is in Schwenksville, pretty close to me. And he taught me kind of the the initial stages of building a folding knife. Um, And then from there, it just kind of progressed. Uh, I'm still working with the machines in my shop. I have two mills, belt grinders, and I just kind of do what I can with what I have. And every day I'm just trying to learn something new so it's crazy. Well, so how how did you get um, a market for your knives? Your your um, your your modifying ballast songs. How does that evolve into these beautifully high end folders? Why, why don't you hold one up so people know what I'm talking about? Sure. Where am I? There we go. So this is one that I just finished um, last week with pearl. Westinghouse, Pearl, and then a dark rubbed CTS XHP blade with zirconium accents. Beautiful. Can you hold up the uh, uh, the clip and also the backspacer close sure. to the uh, camera? 
so the clip, I don't know if you guys can see that that angle is kind of like a black marble finish. It's polished and then stone washed and then, uh, and then colored as the same with the backspacer. And I've, there we go. Right mm. there. And I twist them by hand using the belt grinder. Um, and it's done on both the inside and the outside, which is going to be much harder to show. You can kind of see it. Yeah, but yeah. It's all twisted uh, by hand on the grinder. What, but, what do you mean by that? Twisted by hand on the grinder, actually. So kind of hard. So if, if you're holding this flat, uh -huh. I want it to curve kind of like a half corkscrew on each side. So, you know, this side has this angle. And then when you get to this side, it has this angle. So I'm actually grinding it and twisting it at the same time, kind of like that, across the whole piece. I see. Oh, that's cool. All right. So, so the the question was, you're you're modifying people's ballet songs, which uh, which I'm I'm assuming is a, uh, you know, requires way less in terms of skill, uh, th than creating your own folders and stuff. So, did that did that real shift happen when you met Jeff uh, Blauvelt and you and he started to show you how to how to how to make uh, folders yeah him and uh, a guy rotten design on instagram mm. uh john Sorensen. the both of them are really helpful i mean so i started out just anodizing and actually where the, my camera is set up right next to it is my anodizing station the same one that i bought back when i lived in a little apartment doing all this knife work on the bottom floor um they didn't like that <laughs> <laughs> but you know you start buying machines you start off with just anodizing and from anodizing you learn well maybe i should regrind the blades and so you buy a belt grinder, which was over on this shoulder. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of have that, it's kind of a natural progression, I think, to want to actually make something instead of just modifying someone else's work. Um, yeah. I, I started doing some work for Knife Center, modifying big batches of knives. Huh. And uh, there's still some out there somewhere, I'm sure. They were the uh, Blade Runner Systems bare bones. And I, I used to do batches of six. I must have done 50 of them. Uh, and I would just grind them anodize what I could, replace the hardware and send them to Knife Center. So you're buying, you're getting BRS uh, Bally songs, you're regrinding them, anodizing them, doing stuff, and then selling them back to Knife Center and they're selling them as exclusive BRS models. Is that is that what it is basically? Kind of, so they hired me to do the modifications. Okay, with, okay. With the blessing of uh, BRS back oh. then. Um, I'm still good friends with BRS, but I, I haven't been in the Bally song game for two and a half, three years now. So uh, are ballast songs easier to start working on? Or is that the, is that the type of knife you recommend if you want to start diving in and, and seeing if, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were cool to me uh, back, back when. Um, just, you know, butterfly knives, they're in video games, people, they're in movies, they're just the cool knife. So that's what drew me in. Um, and realistically, the, the knife modding, section of the market really isn't very large for folders mm -hmm. um and there's already a couple guys who have that down i mean rotten design was back when i started he was the guy uh who did regrinds and modifications to folders and ballast songs he really he really got me kind of hooked into that um but no it's i wouldn't start there i mean they're, they're very cool great knives to play with uh you know as long as you don't cut yourself but as far as a use perspective i, I wouldn't get started there Okay, so back in your Starbucks days, you're you're looking, you're developing your taste in knives. Um, is your taste developing uh, uh, beyond your means to where uh, you were kind of lusting after the things you're now making and things that makers like you are making, uh, the high end, fancy with the materials and all? Yeah, so <laughs> it it kind of clicked one day when uh, I was driving and I had my wife bid on an auction on Instagram. <laughs> which was, I think at the time, something like five times my biweekly salary, <laughs> <laughs> which was kind of the moment I realized it's like, I shouldn't do this anymore. If I uh, want to do this, I should probably make them. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at your, at, at your trusting nature that you roped your, your lady into it. You know, Hey baby, just put 4,000. It's all cool. I won't win it, but, just but thankfully it wasn't 4,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. She still gives me crap for it. <laughs> So, okay. Uh, describe your style then. Um, um, I, I call them prestige knives, but really what, what, how would you describe the folders you're making and what are they for other than being looked at and appreciated and, and held? Because to me, they look like little works of jewelry uh, and art. I mean, 
I I I like to think people will use them. Um, I I'm like I I try to build things that I would want to carry, mm-hmm. things that I would want to own. Uh, like this is one that I've been working on the last week, and it's dark tie uh, zer blasted with a dark rubbed XHP core uh, blade, and it's just. It's an inset lock, so it takes a lot of time. They're a lot harder to build, a lot more room to mess up. Uh, for instance, on this one, today I was just, with, with all the snow we're getting and everything that's going on, I just kind of had a brain fart, forgot to put a pocket clip on it. <laughs> <laughs> I finished the entire night, no pocket clip. Well, I'll take it off your yeah. hands, man. It's okay. Uh, I forgive right. you. <laughs> Deal, I have your address. It's all good. So, so you said inset lock, and that's what is an inset lock? Uh, it looks th- that that right to me. If I if I had to guess, looks like a liner lock. What's the difference? So this is a frame lock. Uh, mm. You obviously oh, know what a frame lock is. The outside yeah. is, uh, you know, both sides are titanium. The lock bar is exposed. Mm. Then you have the liner lock, where the full liners are titanium, and then the scale material is kind of uh, held down to the outside. And then you have the inset lock, which is kind of a mixture of both. Where the outside, which would be, you know, the uh, Westy and Pearl here, mm-hmm. the lock bar is actually milled into. So it cuts down on weight. So I can make, like, if I were to make this same knife, like a liner lock, it would probably weigh, I don't know, maybe another ounce and a half. And this way you eliminate all that titanium in the middle and you just have a milled out pocket for the lock bar. It's all kind of integrated. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So it's it's not one piece. It's it's not one piece milled out with a flexible piece of titanium, is it? It is. It is. Oh, yeah. it is. Well, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's I exactly mean, what it is. That's pretty amazing that you can do that and still have a scale like uh, a scale on the outside. Basically, you're splitting that piece of titanium in half. More, uh, more than half. It's a. Uh... So the lock bar here is, let me see if I can aim that. There we go. The lock bar is 80 thousandths thick. And then what's remaining on the outside of the lock bar on this side is 50 uh-huh. thousandths of dark tie, which is very, very thin, uh, but still plenty. So it's, you know, it's so like two thirds of the thickness. Is this a, is this a common thing? Why, why is this ama- blowing my mind right now? Because it's a pain in the butt to do. Okay. Okay. Not it's, too many people do this, right? Uh, there's a fair few makers who do it. I mean, Matt Christensen comes to mind, uh, Walter Randolph, John Barker, uh, Jonas Iglesias, um, Michael Walker. I mean, he he kind of, I think, I think he kind of like coined that. Like that's kind of his thing. Um, they, they just take longer to do and they're really easy to mess up. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like you could go through lots of titanium trying to dial that in, you yes. know. <laughs> My first one, I uh, first time I ever tried it, I used a piece of white and black carbo quartz, which I don't know if you're familiar with the materials, $400 for a piece that's <laughs> six inches by three inches. And to say that that knife isn't great, I think would be a little of an understatement. Um, <laughs> it's it's You learn a lot with the first few. So maybe you, you, you should have cut your teeth on something a little, a little less, <laughs> yeah. a little cheaper. Yeah. It was okay. Damascus and carbo quartz. So is this something that people, when they order a knife from you, because you make, like I said, all handmade custom knives, uh, is that something that people frequently will order? Is that is that a prestige feature of your knives? I, I actually don't accept orders for uh, inset locks oh, just okay. because of the time the time constraints and just how easy they are to ruin. Um, I Before I closed my books a couple of years ago, I, you know, I let people change their orders and I still have some of those that I'm working through, but as far as new orders, I'm not taking them for the incel locks. So you're talking about books. You hear a a lot of uh, custom knife makers talking about closing their books. What, first of all, exactly what does that mean? And, and, and second of all, have people changed? Is that a stressful thing, having a book full of orders? Uh, it, it, are there, like, what are the other ways people do it? So I made the mistake back in 2017, taking like 80 orders. And that was my books. And up until like the first of this year, I had books closed. And uh, it's really stressful. Um, I, I really tried not to take deposits at all. And, and just kind of, you have everything riding on you, especially when you're starting. I mean, for, for a maker who's pretty well established, taking orders and, you know, just giving the, 
caveat that, you know, I don't really have a time frame for these, but I won't take any money up front. We're just kind of going to roll with it. Yeah. It's easier. But when you're getting started, it, it, it can burn you out quickly because you get bored with it. One of the issues with books is you have people telling you exactly what they want, every single detail. And that kind of loses the fun. Hmm. Um, so like when I, when I take orders, I'm just like, look, I'm going to take everything that you said, but I, are you okay if I roll with it kind of my own way? Like take into consideration what you like, what you dislike and kind of do it in my own vision. And that's kind of how we got this knife. The guy said, I want something dressy. I want these materials. And I said, all right, do you care what I do? He said, no, go for it. And this is what came out the other side. So it's just, you know, you, you have both parties have more fun when, when the maker has fun with the knife. I think. Yeah. Perfect. It's like, it's like getting a tattoo, you know, you could walk in there and be like, put this exact thing on my body. Uh, uh, or you could go in there and say, you know, I, I like skulls. What do you got? And yeah. you'll come up with something that you never would have imagined. That's why you're going to a professional. It's the same thing with knife making. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, for, for, for instance, I, uh, there's a guest I had on the show recently and I, I, uh, my parents have offered to get me a knife of his for my upcoming 50th birthday. And immediately I'm like, Ooh, and I want this and I want that and I want this. And, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of getting that, that ready. But at the same time, I want, uh, the reason I love this guy's work is because of him and his, you know, his instincts. So I, I got to make sure that I, I'm not getting too, too far in a hole with, with what I want to, um, you know, give to him. Cause I want him to express himself too. Yeah. But in talking about books, it seems like when you first start, you have no choice but to take all of those 80 orders. You, you, you can't you can't make it look like you don't have the capacity. Right. Yeah. It's it's tough. You have to be available for it. Um, I mean, I think you could, now you could probably get away with it a bit. Um, just kind of doing what you want. There are still some guys that, that do that. I mean, Mike Wynn comes to mind. He takes like five orders a year and just kind of builds what he wants. Um, and. I, I've tried to modify it now where I, I do lottery. Ugh, I can't talk today. Lotteries <laughs> in, in my Facebook group um, for book orders once a month. I take three orders a month. And that's a very manageable number for me. You know, they can order whatever they want with, you know, with the caveat of no inset lock. And uh, I just kind of get to roll with that. They all kind of know this is what you're getting. Here's where we start. And here's where we end. Here's your time frame. Um, but when you're getting started, it's hard not to. Not, not only to, to have the want to tell everyone that you're able to take those orders, but just to feel the security of taking the leap into diving into knife making full time, you want to have work lined up. So it's yes. a feeling of security for yourself as well. Right, right. Which is exactly what it was for me. So do you get afraid? Uh, are you afraid of getting typecast when you have uh, a book? You, you have books with 80 orders and, and they all happen to be the same knife or variations on the same knife because that's what you come out of the gate with and that's what people know you for you end up making 80 of those knives but you want to spread your wings you want to try something else is is that uh is that a problem a little bit um it's, i guess it's kind of a good problem at least you're recognized <laughs> yeah, right yeah right like, and you have a chance to build a style yeah so i mean it is kind of my style like people will say that the, the typical cmf image is like a dark tie show scale dark rub blade, something that's kind of user friendly, but still kind of pretty. Um, when realistically, the stuff that I enjoy making the most is crazy weird stuff, uh, as opposed to just dark tie in Damascus. Right. But when I got started, a lot of the orders, you know, because I wasn't charging very much, I didn't really understand kind of the, the ropes of the knife market at that point. People wanted uh, Damascus, Moku tie, Damascus, anything that they could throw on it just to have fancy materials on there. Um, like I see my websites up here right now. And well, most of this is pretty up to date, but like that first Crusade NF right there, I would probably, when I got started, get 10 orders for that, like something along those lines. And then mm -hmm. I'd make that. And then people would be like, oh, well, he's just making knives with Mokutai and Tamascus. When realistically the stuff I want to make is that second knife with multi-finished zirconium. Oof. That's a bit more fun. I love that design. God, that's beautiful. Thank you. Like oh, you're welcome. Too. You're welcome. You showed a, a dead list before, right? You have one in front of you. Is that yep. right? So um, let, let's see. Let's see this thing up close, because to me, this is a very uh, 
nice blend of kind of utilitarian looking uh, with the sort of plain uh, uh, titanium scales. But you've got the pop with that clip and that gorgeous uh, steel, uh, that blade. What? That is a uh, Mike Norris virus pattern blade. <laughs> It's see okay let's let's see if we can see this uh, pattern put it as close as you can to the camera and put your hand behind it yeah it's just a little too dark but you can tell there's a you know still waters run deep you can tell there's a lot of cool stuff going on in that in that pattern yeah the damascus when it's that when it's that small is hard to see so that that's a uh, uh okay so i look at that knife and um, unlike like the dressed up version, like the Pearl and Westinghouse and some of the other very fancy stuff I've seen you make, that knife right there almost looks like it's ready for production. Like you could, um, it, it looks like it, it could easily be snatched up by one of the big production companies and licensed. Is this a thing you're looking to do with any of your designs? No, I, I tried it once and it's just not for me. If what I'm going to do it again, I'm going to go on my own route. What was your experience without naming names or casting aspersions? What was your experience? I, you know, the the company I used did a great job. Um, I don't want to knock them at all. The main issue just came down to I'm kind of picky and trying to have all the changes I want made in a company that's thousands of miles away is tough. And that's kind of what it comes down to. It's kind of a communication thing and a timing thing, I, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, it was over Chinese New Year and there were all those delays in the beginning of the pandemic. And Oh, OK. OK, so did you manage to get knives out of this uh, situation or, or was it a situation that just kind of uh, ended? No, nope, the knives happened. They, they were oh, out cool. there. They were released. Um, I like them. I still have a few. Uh, but I my main models, I won't make into production knives that just okay. they you know, I don't want to I don't want to show people that I care little about these models and make them into production knives. I'll design something totally new if I'm gonna go that that route again. Okay, so you said before, if you were to go that route again, you would also kind of handle it yourself, which to me makes it sound a little bit uh, like a mid-tech situation, at least how, how I understand that, or I how mean, I understand that to mean. I mean more along the lines of financing and then and totally handling the design aspects. I got you. Um, I mean, just having, you know, have, every channel you add, the, the message gets a little more distorted. I just want to be able to tell the, the end manufacturer, I want this, 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 and this done. And that's it. I don't want anything else. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that this was all happening kind of at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. How has COVID been for business? I know I've bought a lot of knives. Yeah, I think it's been better for a lot of knife makers. I think uh, people are at home, they're getting a little fidgety and they put their money into knives. Um, I, I, I think it's more direct orders. I mean, auctions and lotteries, I think, have gone down a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, as far as direct orders go and direct interest in not, not just my work, but the market as a whole, I think it's stronger than it was the last couple of years. And it, like, uh, does the lack of knife shows, are you feeling that? Do you think most knife makers feel... The fact that they're not going to spaces and meeting, you know, pressing the flesh and bringing their stuff. I miss it a lot. Um, but as far as productivity goes, I think I'm feeling a little less burnt out. Um, you know, having to pay bills for the house while trying to work an extra, you know, 30, 40 hours a week to get knives ready for a show for two months is really stressful. Um, so not having those shows to kind of worry about right now mm. is... A little relaxing. Of course, I miss all my customers. I miss my friends, but I'm okay with it for the moment. Yeah, man. All, all of this started happening uh, the year that uh, Jim and I decided we're going to the knife shows this year. You know, we've been doing this for a year and now, you know, and, and that was a year ago at this point. So we had to cancel those plans and it's it's been a bummer. I do look forward to, you know, mixing it up with the likes of you and and, and others in the future. And I, in, in person, I, I feel like we were we were robbed, but I, I, I should be. It'll all I, come back in good time. Yeah, yeah. I should, I should be a little more uh, gracious. I, I just am getting over having COVID, and I was just pretty much fine. So, so I guess I'm grateful for that for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 
out there in the knife world, okay, so we've been talking a little bit about collaborations and working with other companies. Like, who do you like out there? That's not your work. You know, if if you have, um, who do you think is making great work? Who? What designers do you love? Oh, is it Efros? Yeah, this is Brian Efros. Brian Efros is one of my good friends. He and I do a lot of work together. And this is actually the only custom knife I open. I open the only custom knife I own um, currently. And uh, it's just great. He's he's probably my favorite other custom knife maker right now. Um, uh, the other exceptions, if you know, uh, Walter Randolph, Jeremy Marsh, uh, Michael Birch, you know, the usual mm -hmm. suspect guys. Right, right. But I think Jer uh, Brian Efros deserves a special shout out because he and I good friends. We talk constantly, help each other out. And he's just one of those people who I can call up and be like, Hey, I'm having this issue. He'll help me out. And having owned one of his knives now for several months, it's just spectacular. It's never going anywhere. Yeah. He's, he's been on this show and, uh, uh, he's a cool guy making outstandingly beautiful knives. Now I've never, never held or, or hefted one. I would like to, to change that for sure. Um, who knows? Oh, only recently have I started uh, have I started putting the money into uh, a custom knife here, a custom knife there. I uh, I only have two custom folders and uh, two custom fixed blades. And um, man, I, I got to say that with with each purchase, it, it feels it feels so special that it's part of me wants to really kind of go hard in that direction. But at the same time, I do crave variety and I do crave, uh, I, it's not, it, you know, I do crave uh, more pedestrian knives. I hate to put it that way, but you know, things that you can easily buy and carry. Yeah. So it, there, there is an emotional attachment to these things though. I mean, most of my knife collection is production knives. I mean, right here, I have a Sabenza. Um, I have a Spyderco. Uh, I can never remember the the name that they gave it. It's a Black Snow Custom Sabotage. Oh, model. that's such a cool knife, man. I, I love it. That knife saved me um, a few months uh, back in August when the basement flooded. We had to pull all the carpet out of the basement, and that's the only knife I had. So now there's like a, a solid flat spot from being rubbed against <laughs> cement while me and my electrician yanked all of it out and just cutting oh, it. God. But that that That's one of those knives that's never going to go anywhere, just, just based on how much value it's given me with with – just that whole process. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, it's funny because pretty much uh, every, almost every knife I have in my in my cabinet could probably handle, you know, uh, whatever it is that I need. Like, uh, but when I actually have to do work or do something like that, as a matter of fact, cutting carpet, uh, I have a zero tolerance that I used for cutting carpet. Now I'll never get rid of it because I actually did work with it and it did yeah. great. <laughs> and. Uh, and I'm thinking most of my knives could probably do great work if I gave them a chance. But yeah. this, you know, my well, lifestyle. giving them a chance part. You know, I mean, cutting boxes isn't giving them a chance. Right. You, you really got to take one out and go camping with it and hammer it through some stumps. Yeah, yeah, and 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 with a with a frame lock, squeeze it and horse it through stuff, and then later close it and feel how that what that experience is. You know, <laughs> my my dad has a knife that I built back in 2017. And I, I tell him all the time, it's like, Dad, you can't use it as a screwdriver. You can't open, <laughs> you can't open paint cans with it. You shouldn't use it the way that he uses it. And every time I go up to his house, I, I have to bring an entire toolkit and and like re repair it. <laughs> I mean, the the blade edge started out, you know, looking round like that, uh -huh. but now it's just flat because oh. he sharpens it on on uh, wet stones himself and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uses it to open cement bags. And hey, that is awesome, though. It's really yeah. actually a great thing to know that there's someone out there uh, taking your knives and and really working them like that. Because I'm 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 just going out on a limb here. I'm betting most people, like the gentleman who ordered that Westinghouse and Pearl knife, he's not going to be opening cement bags. I doubt it. <laughs> and and it's probably not something you're ready to do frequently. It is to work and spend all this time and money on a knife and then take it out and destroy it and see where it can go. Uh, so actually, your dad is doing you a hell of a service. Yeah, I, I like it when people use my knives. Even, you know, I mean, with the Damascus, that's fine. Go for it. I mean, once you get into like Pearl and Westinghouse, I, I would say, you know, still use it. Don't hammer it through stuff. Yeah, use it but, at that wedding, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But nothing, nothing too crazy. But I, I do build all of them to the same 
you know, standard here. There's there's retaining pins in the back, retaining pins up front, so there's no flex or anything. Um, they they they're all built to be used. But okay, so I, I want you to show the um on the mini. What's the, the mini micro? that you? Or, I'm micro. sorry, the micro. Let's take a look at that flipper tab. The, this this knife is really cool. So before we started rolling, you kind of took this, me through this a bit. This is one of the bigger ones on the table here, but that's oh. the uh, that's the flipper tab there. Wow, it's about a sixteenth of an inch tall. And then on the the Daedalus, it's a little smaller than that. In fact, it's hard to see. That's unreal. Actually, hold it up without your thumb, and let's see if the silhouette against the light there. Yeah, you right can there, see a tiny there. little bit yeah. rise above. If you're if you're only listening to this podcast, uh, Ian makes these flippers that are undetectable as flippers when you look at them, but there's just a slight bit of proud material from the tang on the back of the blade, and and you can, I guess there's a jimp in it, uh, and you can just yeah. pull back on it. Yep, there's a little jimping right there, right at the very wow. front. It's just. Oh, that was a cool shot, by the way. Uh, the the little little guy actually has a comparatively quite large flipper tab. So so now, what what are the challenges of dialing in that detent? You've got a a micro flipper, and then you also have thumb studs, and you know, uh, presumably, you want them to be equally useful. Yes. Um, so I set my action for the thumb studs, not for the flipper tab. Uh, the flipper tab is just a happy accident. Mm. And I figured it out one day. Uh, just I was messing around with a broken knife. And the flipper tab is above and forward of the pivot. And as long as it's there, you can, and you have a little jimping, a little grip, you can get it to, to pull. It doesn't have to be large. But I do set all of my detents for thumb studs. Wow. So it's I love the shape of that one process. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I, I really like the shape of that blade. It reminds me of a um, a Brend fixed blade fighter. I mean, it reminds me. That I'm not calling it derivative or anything, but it has those kind of swooping curves on on the the spine and on the on the uh, edge that just are so pleasing. I mean, those were the guys that kind of drew me in. Walter Brend, uh, Jerry Hossum, Jerry Hossum, I think. Hossum, yeah. Hossum, yeah. Um, I just love the recurves and I love uh, just big swoopy lines, you know, taking, taking it from older cars and art in general, just those, yeah. those lines and putting them into knives is visually pleasing to me. And so how do you approach the designs? I mean, are you, are you constantly working on new designs uh, and how does that work? My, my newest design is, is this one help if I could actually flip it. There we go. Uh, it's the Omega model and it's, it's loosely based on my old Argonaut. Um, I wanted something that was kind of sheep's foot, something that was more user friendly, has a mm. slightly larger handle, fits in the hand better. Um, not everyone has gorilla hands like me. <laughs> oh, geez. That's an eight and a half inch knife. Oh, wow. So you really are a gorilla, man. <laughs> It's I, I do still design stuff, but it's more for fun. You never know if it's actually going to play out. Like if I'm sometimes I'll draw something and I'll spend a couple of weeks looking at it, refining it, drawing new lines and I'll just, nah, I don't like it. So really, I've, I've spent my time refining the ones that I've been making, like the the Crusade. I mean, if you go, I don't know if I have it on my website, but I'm sure you can find it. Uh, the original Crusade looked nothing like this. Nothing no. at all. And it's just been, you know, four years of iterations. So it's evolved from that first one. It's not just you're reusing the name, obviously. Yeah, yeah, correct. And uh, like this is the technically, the, I think, third version of the uh, the mistress model. It has more of the straight cutting edge with a smaller tanto tip. The handle's a little less pointy. It has a slightly bigger butt. Um, and they, they've, like I've said, they've all the original Daedalus doesn't look anything like this either. I mean, it was it was a big fat knife, uh, mm -hmm. and it was actually uh, started out as a Tonto, oh, and then it just kind of evolved into this. So, so is is that Daedalus the the biggest thing you have uh, in front of you? What like what what are the size ranges? You said eight and a half. That makes it what a three and a half inch blade. Yeah, this is I think the biggest one I have. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, this is the biggest by about an eighth of an inch. Um, wow. And this is probably maxing out at 8.5, 8.6 inches. Um, here's a hand for comparison. 
And uh, the smallest I go is the Micro Mistress, which is, I think, 6.5 inches overall. 6.5. Man, that handle, that that whole knife is so cool, and that's, yeah, that's a that's a Tanto tip. It looks like, yep, uh, Tanto hand rub, and I mean this this model. I, I actually that's one of the reasons I had to change it so much. The original iteration of the Mistress looked a lot like the uh, Crusade. Oh. I mean, you can even see the the spines are kind of based on each other. Yeah, you can see a family lineage, but they definitely appear to be different knives. Well, now they do. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> they, they, they grew out of one thought, maybe. Yeah, before they were a little incestuous. So uh, uh, design, um, like design-wise, who are your current... Okay, actually, I think I just asked that, and, and, you, and you told me, but I keep thinking of Charles Marlowe for some reason. Um, his blade shapes, uh, not not that they remind me at all of yours, but there's something about uh, uh, the spirit of those knives that kind of remind me, uh, put me in the same frame of mind as as yours. Um, and and I think part of that to me is their uh, their kind of hard to come by ness, uh, but that that curve, that organic sensibility, uh, uh, to me is is part of what your style is all about. I mean, Barlow is, he's spectacular. I mean, his ballast songs when I first got started were like the, the top of the top. And his his folders are still knives. I mean, I, I told you that Efros was one of the ones that I own. Yeah. I would own a Marlowe in a heartbeat. In fact, I've, I've helped a couple of friends get them. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm constantly hitting them up. Like, hey, you're going to send me that so I can play with it for a little while and feel like I have one of these? And they're just unbelievable knives. And he's a fantastic knife maker. So, okay. All right. So... You are this person making knives one at a time, handmade, and and you're and you're uh, protective of your designs. You don't necessarily want to flood the market with with your designs until you're ready to do something mid techy. Like, what are you from that perspective? How do you feel about the the knife market in general, which kind of has a glut of manufacturers, and uh, and and I'm not saying this in a bad way at all. I would like to count myself among them, but there are a glut of designers as well. And people just producing things and having designs, uh, you know, it's a very, very bustling market right now. How does that, uh, you know, what are your impressions of that? Uh, explain how you feel about that. I love it. Um, I, I don't think, the, I mean, the thing you, you see is that all of, yeah, there's a lot of knife designers and a lot of manufacturers, but they're all doing their own thing. I don't see too many people who are kind of like, oh, that guy's looks a lot like mine. Mine looks a lot like that guy's. And we all kind of take bits and pieces from each other, um, at least in the mid-tech production world um, or the custom world, really. But I love it. There's something for everyone. I mean, you can you can come into the knife market and not have any idea what you want. Find something that really suits you. And there's a whole subsection of the knife market that is just, just that. I mean, we're talking like cleavers, the overbuilt stuff. Hmm. You want a knife with three blades on it, you're going to find a knife with three blades on it. You want a fixed blade that weighs 10 pounds, you'll find it. And there's someone making it and they're enjoying it. And that's great. I, you know, if you can, if you can make a business out of designing something that you like and other people like too, that's fantastic. Uh, so I, 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 you know, personally couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I love all of the uh, choice. I love all the choice. Actually, sometimes I curse all the choice because funds are so limited and it's like kind of hard to everything. Yeah. Yeah, really. And I don't know what that's about, but I, I could, I could uh, I could spend a long time trying to figure out you know what that's all about, but uh, I, I think I actually misspoke earlier um, when I said that I think it cheapens custom knives to make uh, productions of custom models. I don't think it cheapens them. I think it's you know largely up to the maker. You want to get that design into more people's hands. It's just not for me. I don't want to offend anyone because that's not my intention here. Got um, you. I, I didn't get that impression. I, I just kind of felt like you meant for your designs, you want them yeah. to be limited to your. For me, they're like my children. I like, I like to make them. I like to know that they are coming from me. So, uh, how many of your children are out there in the wild? How many? No really, you have no idea how many knives you've made. No, that might be know. an interesting thing to sit down and do the math on someday. <laughs> I don't know, three, three hundred maybe. I don't know. Wow, 
That's, I mean, when you add all the hours up and you add all the learning up, that's, that's pretty amazing. I've been trying to take it easy the last few months. One of the things that I got wrong the first three years of business was working too much to the point where it was affecting personal relationships and my my mind a bit. I mean, I was working, you know, 12 hour days, seven days a week. Um, I've cut that down to 10 hour days, six days a week. So do you think that's something that a lot of knife makers, especially uh, on the up and coming side, are uh, fall victim to kind of overwork? I mean, I think burnout's real. I don't want to speak for other knife makers, but yeah. I, you know, I see... There are knife makers who post on Eastern Coast time at two in the morning and they're still in the shop. And, you know, that's totally fine. If that's the way they want to work, they can do whatever they want. It's just I can't do that. Yeah. Well, that's that's part of the beauty of having a creative job or, you know, doing creative things is taking advantage of that time when everyone else is sleeping uh, or resting. But how, so how how would you because I've experienced uh, not just in knife making, but I've seen it in other creative realms and, and I could see where knife making just everything has to take a lot of time, you know, and if you want to get ahead, you have to put in the time. Um, but how do you recommend uh, knife makers kind of uh, do themselves a favor? How, how can they be kind to themselves? Just remember that it's a job. I mean, yeah, you can love your job, but it is still a job. Um, no matter how much you love it, you're going to get tired. You're going to get burnt out. Um, you just need to take time for yourself. If you want to go inside and watch a movie at nine in the morning, do it. You know, you don't have to answer to anybody. Yeah. If you want to fit the Jack Daniels at 10 a.m., damn it, just go for it. No, I'm just kidding. Of hey, course, I'm... alcohol and machines don't. don't... <laughs> I'm just... it's, of, it's... Of... The only time you have alcohol in the shop is on Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. When you have visitors come by or yeah, something. When, like the only, when the only machine you're using is a hand drill. That's it. <laughs> So this uh, shop, you're sitting in your shop. It's it, what are the things you want to uh, build out? How do you want to? How do you want to continue uh, growing your shop to to optimize it for your use? Well, I'd like to get rid of this shop, um, and then I'd like to move from here. Uh, I'd like if I had a space like twice the size that I have now, and maybe three feet taller. I'd I'd like to get a CNC machine. I'd like to learn how to use a CNC machine. Uh, not to make mid text and stuff. I just want to make, you know, if I could make this knife, like right now I did that on the belt grinder, like this fitting up. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure if I spent, you know, two or three days, I could get that to be flush, but I want to be able to do stuff like that, but on a much smaller scale and just be able to put that on the knife. So a CNC would CNC machine would do that for me, but I want rigid machines. Like uh, there are knife makers out there with, with bridge ports and uh, clousing mills, just giant monstrosities. And I just can't have that here. No, oh, okay. There's, I mean, I live at the top of a hill, and then there's like a sharp ninety degree turn, and then a little hill to get into my shop. That's just not coming in here. So I, I'd like, I'd like more machines. Just I want, I want a pantograph. I want to be able to do weird stuff all the time. Uh, describe what a pantograph is. Okay, so a pantograph is like if I were to take a pen, and trace out this circle, it would make a really small circle like over here. So like, uh, I think that's kind of the best way to put it. So you, it's kind of like handwriting, but your handwriting is being translated onto a sketch pad that's two feet to your left at a much smaller font. It's pretty amazing. I've seen one and yeah, uh, it, it looks like, um, I remember thinking it looked kind of like two record players kind of in, in a way. And, and you, you have a stylus Mm -hmm. And you draw out with your stylus, say, if you're going to make an inlay, I've seen it used for doing inlays, right? Crazy yep. inlay work. Mm -hmm. uh, you can draw out how you want the inlay on a large design, mm -hmm. and, and it's calibrated to do the same exact thing on, on different scales, I guess, however you... Yeah, like one one to four, like uh, you're, you're, the big piece is one, and then you're making it four times smaller, I think. I don't have a pantograph, so I'm not sure if that's really how it works, but... It, it's pretty it's, amazing. It's old tech. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool though. It's all mechanical. They're very cool machines, but they they the footprint is gigantic. <laughs> I mean, just because you have like giant swinging arms going all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they're really very cool machines. So, do you think if you got a CNC or when you get a CNC, you're going to be your your production will go up naturally? I would imagine uh, just because the speed with which you can do some of the grunt work is increased. 
do you see yourself, is there an issue with um, how many you might make or uh, how quickly they might be made or what you might charge for them? Like, does that whole dynamic change once you introduce uh, automation? I don't, so I, my goal with the CNC machine wouldn't really be to increase my production speed. Okay. Um, it would just be to do new things, uh, you know, milling patterns, um, stuff that I couldn't do now. Hmm. Um, bolster locks, just think things that need a computer to do it. But I, I enjoy, you know, using the bandsaw to cut out frames. I enjoy grinding out the shapes because it makes all of them different. I mean, I can have two of the same, I don't know if I have any here, but I can have two of the same knife. Um, I do have one here. Like this is the mini version of yeah. this knife. And, uh, you know, I like the fact that this one is different from this one. And that's just because, you know, I got to spend a couple hours at the grinder grinding it differently so that, you know, they're the same uh -huh. DNA, but slightly different bone structure. Right. I, I like that. And I, I'm not looking to get rid of that. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. And, and oftentimes that's the draw of the CNC is, is the exactitude. Well, I want each one to be exactly the same each time. And, uh, but if you're making knives by hand and, and part of the charm of them is the fingerprint nature of it. You're yeah. yeah. So, so it, it's a matter of how you would end up using the tool. Yeah, exactly. I like my lathe probably shouldn't be used for half the stuff I do on my lathe. <laughs> So you make all your own hardware before you were you were saying right you turn your uh, your own uh, pivots so I and everything. I I have made some of my own hardware. I've made some of my own screws. I have made my own pivot screws, but like uh, for this one, like this is a modified Steve Kelly pivot, half inch. I use the lathe to kind of grind it so it looks like a hat, and uh, and then I make a cap for it. So that kind of sits on there. Oh, I but I. All the times I've made my own hardware, like actually made my own pivot screws from from flat stock and uh, eighth inch thick titanium wire like this, I just use a hand drill. Um, I like to live on the edge. <laughs> I love it, love it. So, so are you ever you ever consider getting uh, a, a a shop assistant or someone that you mm, no? No, I don't like people that much. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, people people are one thing, but also like, I guess one of the going from a one man shop to a multi person shop uh, is it seems like it would be just going from one to two is the hugest because you actually have to show ev show that person everything you know and 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 all of the shortcuts you know you basically have to show them the shortcuts uh, that took you a long time to arrive at. And then you have to trust that they can make, it like I can make your work and, and that you can send it out with your name on it. I, I feel like this is one of the biggest challenges uh, that I've heard from, from people is that growth can be difficult because of that factor right there. Like I got to bring someone in and trust them enough, uh, you know, and then, and then it ends up, you're actually doing the work of two people because everything they do, you're gonna have to check and you have to look over. Yeah, I I don't see that happening anytime soon. At least, um, if I'm if I want to grow out, I'll you know start my own like a whole separate little company where I just design and kind of go like Elijah Isham, where okay. he, where he's just a fantastic knife designer and just kind of makes them all different companies, all different price ranges. I mean, it, I think that's more a growth side than adding more people to the shop to crank out more customs. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, people Again, that's just for me. I'm well, gonna, it's like it's like going to a play at, at, to see, you know, a famous actor and then that actor is sick that night, so you watch the understudy. It's like, ah, you know, I've been waiting, you know, that that, that happened to me once. But but still, <laughs> the the point was like I, I didn't go there to see John Fabitz. I went there to see uh, uh Captain Picard. I can't remember that guy's name, was, you know. And, and Jean Luc Picard. Yeah. yeah, I went. I went to see that actor, and he was uh, Patrick Stewart, and it was uh, you know it was yeah. it was Joey Joey Johnny, you know, who got up there. But um, it's the same thing with the knives. If I if yeah. I get a CMF Metalworks knife, I don't want it made by uh, by Joey over in the corner. I want it made by you. Yeah. So I I, I see what you I see what you mean.
So uh, where do you see where do you see CMF uh, in the future? Is, is it something? Are, are we going to see some sort of a, a side mid tech company where you just get to design and let your mind express itself that way? Uh, maybe I'm. I don't know. For now, I'm just enjoying making custom knives. Uh, I love it, and I just want to keep doing that at least for now until I have a more hashed out plan for how I'd like to expand. Um, I'd like it to be on my own terms. I'd like it to be, you know, realistically, if I can, I'd like to have it be all in house, um, kind of along the lines of the halts, but oh, still yeah, do, yeah. still do my custom knives as my main source of, uh, inspiration and creativity. Uh, yeah, that was a selfish question because, you know, I know it's not going to be too soon till I have one of your knives, but at the same time, you know, hoping may maybe I'll, I'll plant a seed right there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get one in your hands. Don't worry. Oh, well, okay. I, everyone heard that. I mean, you said that out loud. So how do, how do people get these things in their hands? Like what, how do you prefer people to go about uh, hunting you down and, and, getting an order and and how does that all work for you now i use my facebook group mostly uh instagram has really hit knife makers pretty hard with uh you know interactions and everything i'm i have 20 20 something thousand followers i get 200 likes and 3000 people see it so i think most of it via instagram is word of mouth but my facebook group is how i do most of my selling it's where i do almost all of my interactions um like i said i do my my once a month uh book book spot lotto in there. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Long day. <laughs> and uh, I do lottos first come first serve. Um, I'm trying a new one called fourth come first serve to kind of <laughs> mess with those first three people who are always ready to click in. <laughs> fourth come first serve. <laughs> um, Love it. And that's how I like to sell knives. I like it when I can get other people involved. I mean, I know it's not everyone's style, which is why I do still try and get knives over to like Knifeology, uh, Matt over at Slice FK. Uh, Blade HQ, I'm I'm very close with. So, I mean, I like to give them a few knives a year uh, just for those people who don't want to have to, you know, be in on a lottery and try and race to be first come first serve, win at auction, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and now I'm trying to be more personal with it, with the uh, the once a month book spot lottos. Once a month book spot. So uh, do people, uh, when, when they want to sell one of your knives, do they come to you? I mean, I sometimes see people, uh, custom makers on Instagram saying, Hey, look, I saw, I saw so-and-so was getting, selling one of my knives. Do, do you ever get involved in the brokerage of your knives once they're, once they're out there? I'll repost them. Um, like I'll, like I have friends who want to stay anonymous in the knife game. And if I need to sell something for them, I can stick it up in the buy, sell trade group. Um, you know, I'm just following the directions of the person who wants to sell it. Um, if you come to me and say, Hey, how much did I sell this for? I mean, I can give you a table price. I'll tell you that, but otherwise that's up to you. Um, I really, I'd like to be rather disconnected from that. If it's not, you know, someone who I'm very close with and wants to stay anonymous or a, uh, I'm sorry, a, like a third party seller, like Knifeology, Slice of K, like I'll repost that kind of stuff. No problem. Well, uh, I'd love to get one of your knives on the channel here at some point. Uh, maybe, maybe at some point uh, we can work something out where uh, where you loan me one, and I'm very careful with it, and I don't and I don't carry it over uh, concrete because I have a. No, no, I, I encourage you to carry over concrete. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, unless you're really good at fixing tips. Uh, yeah, don't don't let me carry I did, it. Over. I did one yesterday. Uh, sure. A guy he dropped his knife on ceramic tile and accidentally stepped on it. Oh God. Yeah. I want to meet this guy. I, I, yeah. I feel he's my my kindred spirit. <laughs> hey, I did it. I so I built my I tried to build myself a couple knives a year, and uh, I wanted to see what would happen if I if I did. I, so I used to do. I don't really think I have one here, um, but I used to do these really tall swedges. They were like a half inch tall, really deep, and I did it with a spider hole. And I built that knife for myself. And uh, me and my friend, we were having barbecue, and there were libations. And they were throwing it at a tree. Oh and, my god! <laughs> and the, uh, the the blade broke off. So if I build myself a knife, I can send it. You can do whatever you want with it. Okay. All right. I can, I can fix it. <laughs> Deal. So so you do carry your own knives? When I have them, yeah. Okay, because I've heard a lot of people say, "Hey, you, you carry your paycheck around with you," and that makes a lot of sense. That, to me that's too. exactly what it is. It's really you, you spend that much time building something, and you think to yourself, "You know, I should probably get paid for this." Yeah. Um, yeah. There's always there's always something to buy, whether it's machines, materials, taxes, something like that. Um, 
So I, I mean, that's why I can justify carrying someone else's knife. But if I build myself a knife, it maybe has a maximum lifespan of two weeks in my pocket before, before I, I think to myself, I should probably get rid of this. Um, so I, I, whenever I build myself something, I have to put something on the outside. Like I'm not going to sell this, like I <laughs> engrave it on there. <laughs> so that you end up keeping it, but, yeah. but, but you, you know, you would have the know-how to grind it out. So who knows, maybe <laughs> someone out there has a, an a Ian Pekarski original EDC. I think there's three or four of them out there. So what do you think is your best EDC knife? I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to rank your children here. Okay. So to actually carry and use. Mm -hmm. uh i'm pretty pretty happy with how this one is um this is my omega model and it's just there's no recurve it's you know it's just flat edge and then you have a tip so this is a good slicer um i know that not not everyone thinks recurves are all that i i like them i have people who carry these and use them um but if i were going to rank them i'd probably say the omega which is the sheep's foot for those who are just listening mm -hmm. um the micro mistress which is a Tonto for those listening. And then my recurve iterations, which would be the Crusade and the Daedalus. Okay. I would, I would take the Daedalus. I mean, if, if, if all things were equal at this very moment. I, you know, I think it's funny that you say that because I think this is actually my least popular model. Is it really? I just, yeah, something, something about that, that beautiful recurve blade does it for me. I, I, I make them the least. I mean, I, I think this is my favorite knife closed personally. Mm. I, I just like the way that everything, it kind of looks like a banana. Yeah, it's like very self-contained and smooth. Yeah, I I love it, but the things I love, not everyone loves, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, well, at, at least it's all coming from you, you know what I'm saying? And yes. and your design, uh, your design um, uh, sense. Uh, anyway, Ian, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man, catching up with you. Uh, is there is there anything else you, you'd like to let us know about? Do you have any new models coming out or anything uh, we should keep our eyes peeled for? Not at the moment. Um, I mean, for people who like waffles, uh, I do sometimes do St. Jude's or Toys for Tots um, waffles. Uh, I don't want to say the R word. Oh, oh, I see. At first, I was like, mm, <laughs> yeah. I like waffles. Okay, oh, I, I see what you mean. You mean yeah. like that that kind of arrangement where where people try to acquire something by bidding on it, or uh, where you pay, you know, you maybe donate ten dollars and get a couple spots. Right, right. That's what it is. Like a waffle. Gotcha. Yeah, like a waffle with an R at the front. <laughs> see, I didn't realize that this was an issue, but we we got to do an awful lot of this on on oh, sure. uh, on the tube that is you these days <laughs> so. you got to sense yourself a bit but la last year we raised thirty seven thousand dollars for uh we raised just under thirty thousand dollars for uh for toys for tots and we raised um uh, around seven dollars seven dollars seven thousand dollars for saint jude's and then uh you know, a couple thousand for some dog rescues that's but amazing then, you said we now is that who we who we as in my group okay um, you know, my, I have an incredible customer base and client base. They're spectacular, every single one of them. And, uh, I mean, just, just last week I, uh, I did a waffle for an EDC version of this knife and it brought in $5,500 for St. Jude's. That's, that's great, man. I, I really love hearing that you're, uh, putting your efforts and, and your artistic uh, nature towards helping people out. That's as that's admirable. Well, you know what they say, when people have met something, they want to start giving back. So you've mastered I, I this it. thing. <laughs> and, so, and someone was giving me uh, giving me crap in my Facebook group. He said, Hey, we all know that you're only doing this just to get the awards. <laughs> so <laughs> humanitarian of the year, Ian Pekarski. <laughs> oh yeah. It's purely selfish. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show, sir. It's been thanks great catching up with you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I love the work you're doing. I, I look forward to seeing it every day in my Instagram feed and just keep doing it. Keep wowing us with that stuff. I'll try. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Take care, sir. Hey, you too. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. 
There he goes, Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Well, like I said, it was great to catch up with him again. And I kind of forgot uh, in the interim how much of an artist he is uh, in that everything is made by his hands and he that's how he wants to keep it. And, uh, you know, just perfecting and refining these models. And yet each one is its own unique thing, just like an artist making artwork. So uh, it was a real pleasure to catch back up with him. And uh, yeah, it's it's re-inspired me to, to try and get one of these things in hand. And I think maybe on this episode, I made a little headway. Is this all for my own selfish edification? Um, sometimes I think so, but but that's all right, because we all get to talk to people and hear from, from people like Ian Pekarski, et cetera. So for Ian and for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying thanks for checking us out again this week and come back here next Sunday for another great interview. And in the meantime, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Ninth Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.